Buonasera a tutti. Eh, stasera parleremo in inglese, quindi adesso faccio un piccolo, un piccolo eh, saluto e chi ha preso le, le cuffiette eh, può cominciare a usarle. So, good evening everyone. I'm Costantino Marmo, director of the Umberto Ecos International Center for Humanities of the University of Bologna. Welcome to the second uh, Umberto Eco lecture by Eshkol Nevo. <coughs> it's a great pleasure to have him again here. Uh, just a few words before uh, leaving the floor to our guest, <coughs> who, by the way, needs no introduction, otherwise you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be here. <coughs> uh, for those who were not here in, on February 28th, when we had the first uh, Umberto Eco lecture, uh, these classes are uh, master classes entrusted to personalities of national and international uh, relevance. Uh, when Umberto Eco, back then, director of the Higher School of Humanities of the University of Bologna, launched the, the first series of master lectures addressed to the university and the city of Bologna. We were in January 2000. <coughs> for the first lecture, Elie Wiesel was invited. For the last, in spring to, uh, 2014, Oran Pamuk. <coughs> in between, there have been contributions from illustrious personalities such as Luciano Berio, uh, Georg Steiner, Douglas Sofstetter, uh, Julia Cristeva, and so on. In February 2020, the Umberto Eco Lectures, uh, International Center of Humanities uh, of the University of Bologna, started a new cycle of lecture dedicated to the memory of Umberto Eco, <coughs> the Umberto Eco Lectures. Uh, just in <clears throat> case. Uh, we first invited Samantha Cristoforetti, our beloved astronaut, and after the forced break <clears throat> of the pandemic, the pandemic, we kept on with three lectures by Elena Ferrante, staged in November, <clears throat> November 2021 <clears throat> by the wonderful actress Manuela Mandracchia. <clears throat> and they are on, uh, online if you are interested in uh, listen to them um, on the uh, YouTube channel of the Umberto Eco uh, Center. <clears throat> we now have Eshkol Nevo, one of the most important contemporary Israeli writers and one of my favorite authors. He's uh, an author that is very much, I very much admire for his ability to tell stories set in a very difficult territory full of tensions and uh, without letting these uh, uh, tensions take over. <clears throat> and for his ability to build characters whose stories, voices, and points of view intertwine in wide-ranging narratives in a web of human relationship of universal significance. I am very happy Eshkol Nevo accepted to deliver a second lecture, and maybe a third one in next fall. <clears throat> I will keep you posted. Uh, finally, I am particularly curious about what going to say on the theme chosen by, this, by, his, uh, by him this time, intimacy. And we are quite intimate, <laughs> I think. Uh, some passages from his books uh, will be read in Italian translation by Simone Francia, which I thank, I thank on Eshkol's request. So, thank you, Eshkol. The floor is yours. Buonasera. I'm glad uh, to be here again uh, the, in February. When I was here in Bologna, it was freezing cold. <laughs> and now it's a bit different. <laughs> so thank you for coming in this very uh, uh, challenging weather. And you'll see in October. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start. Uh, after two years of COVID, after being forced to avoid our friends, our parents, our children, I think we learned to reappreciate the value of close relationships in our lives. We know now, more than ever, how much we need each other, how dependent we are in the empathy of other people, in the feedback of other people, in their physical presence. 
This is one reason I chose to talk about intimacy with you today. The other reason is more personal. I think that understanding intimacy is probably my main project. My main project in life and my main project as a writer. Of course, every book of mine is different from the other. They have different settings, different plots, different characters. But if I had to choose one common thread linking them all, it would be the fascination from what happens between human beings as they get closer. What are the hidden particles floating in the air between us? So, especially for you here in Bologna, I went back to my own books and drew out of them questions I had and I still have about intimacy. Before laying them out, let me give you a, a heads up, a warning. I'm not going to give answers to these questions. No, I'm not an expert for intimacy, nor do I have the tendency to preach. I do hope to provoke thinking by raising these questions, and I do hope that within the following hour, you will find yourself, from time to time, identifying, saying to yourself, hey, I feel the same way, or hey, I'm facing the same challenge. And maybe that would be the beginning of redemption. So, let's start our quest with osmosis. What is osmosis? The definition you can find in Wikipedia is osmosis is the diffusion of molecules through the selectively permeable membrane of the cell. But, of course, I'm not interested today in the chemical osmosis per se. I'm interested, and I was always interested, in a different kind of osmosis. The one between political, public events that happened around us and our private, intimate lives. In what way a public event that is reported in the news can diffuse into our family lives, into our relationships. I live in a country in which it is hard to make the distinction between private and public. There is always something happening in Israel, a war, a terror attack, a political crisis, actually, as we speak. Can you really be detached from that? Also, as we learned in February 2020, even if you live in a relatively peaceful country like Italy, a mysterious virus can come from China and rock your life. In my short story, Lemonade, published in La Corriere della Sera during the COVID lockdowns, a young couple is trying to cope with the financial crisis in their lives caused by COVID. Let's hear the opening of that story in Italian. <laughs> da Limonata. Dal momento in cui hanno costretto entrambi a prendere ferie non retribuite e chiuso le scuole ai bambini, Gavri ha cominciato a vagare per casa come un iRobot, ripetendo di continuo la stessa frase, con i limoni noi ci dobbiamo fare una limonata, con i limoni noi ci dobbiamo fare una limonata, con i limoni noi ci dobbiamo fare una limonata. La prima settimana ha progettato di distribuire online seminari di recitazione davanti alla videocamera. Si fa il botto, di sicuro, ha cercato di convincere me per convincere se stesso. Tutti sono piantati in casa davanti allo schermo per tutto il giorno, tutti hanno una videocamera nel telefono, nel computer, piacerà da morire! Tesoro, non dire da morire, gli ho risposto, non è il caso in questo momento. E lui si è irritato, ma perché mi metti bastoni fra le ruote? L'ho detto solo a te da morire. Ovvio che nella pubblicità non scriverei niente del genere. La pubblicità è consistita di un post sulla pagina di Facebook. Regista di teatro, vincitore del premio Riccio d'Oro, propone seminari di recitazione davanti alla videocamera, accompagnamento individuale o in gruppo, posti limitati. 
era indeciso se accompagnare con la fotografia di una videocamera o di una di se stesso e alla fine, come prevedevo, ne ha messa una di se stesso. Di dieci anni fa era indeciso se investire in un'inserzione sponsorizzata e alla fine, come prevedevo, e infatti non ci ho messo becco perché non mi accusasse dopo che era stato un flop per colpa mia, ha deciso di non investire perché non è il momento di spendere. Il post ha ricevuto molti like e alcune condivisioni, ma concretamente solo una persona si è interessata all'iscrizione. Una ragazza di 25 anni e anche lei alla fine voleva solo filare un po' con uno dei miti della sua adolescenza, non iscriversi davvero. Okay, this is going to be fun. I'm going to enjoy today. It's beautiful, beautiful way of uh, capturing the music of this story. So, this is the beginning of Lemonade. Later on, when they find out, this couple, that their credit card is blocked, the husband manipulatively convinces his wife to earn easy money by opening a porn live channel where she would perform her famous trick naked, and he would be, of course, behind the camera. This will not leave their relationship as they were. In real life, I'm coming back to real life, two of my own close friends got divorced lately, just after the Omicron wave has ended. Was it only because of the pandemic? I'm not sure, but I'm quite sure that some sort of osmosis happened there, a change in the balance of moleculas brought a hidden truth out. The second question I wanted to raise is also connected to osmosis, but this time it's the silent subliminal osmosis occurring within the intimate relationship itself. Amir and Noah from Nostalgia are students. They both have intense personalities. He studies psychology and sometimes feels that dealing with mentally ill people is too much for him. She studies photography and sometimes she feels that being exposed to criticism on her work is too much for her. Let's hear the scene and discover what is the preservation of sadness law. E se stroncassero anche la mostra di New York? Domanda lei, voltandosi sulla schiena. Non è più appallottolata. Non piange. Mi rivolge i suoi begli occhi, mezzo amareggiata e mezzo riconoscente. Allora torneremo a Lilton, propongo, a stropicciargli un po' le lenzuola. E tu comincerai a lavorare per la mostra successiva, ok? Ok, dice lei conciliante. Poi aspetta un momento e mi domanda con lo sguardo assolutamente serio. È vero che mi amerai anche se sarò un completo, eterno fallimento? Dopo che Amira ha succhiato via il dispiacere a Noah, un pochino gli ne resta attaccato. Si deposita laggiù, nelle profondità della pancia. Così, sottilmente, agisce la legge di conservazione della tristezza. Coming back to osmosis, it is quite natural that our partner or friend will feel sad or stressed out and will, we will be there to support him. But what happens when sadness becomes depression and stress becomes anxiety? Can we support without paying a price, without the moleculas of depression committing osmosis into us? And for how long? How can we tell that we have reached the point that this intimate support is becoming an impossible burden, that after being osmosed, we are the ones who need support now? Another 
fascination of mine is attraction. Why are we attracted to certain people? Well, when it comes to romantic attraction, there are obvious physical elements to that. But what about friendships? I guess some of you came here today with your friends. Can you point out the reason that brought you together? The original spark? With the main friendship in La Simetria di Desideri, my friendship book, it was all about a certain sense of humor. Gli auguravo tutto questo e intanto avevo nostalgia di lui, del suo fuoco interiore che mi ispirava, della dedizione totale che dimostrava in ogni conversazione con un amico, anche quando era impegnato, preoccupato o stanco, dell'occhiata rapida, sorridente che mi lanciava quando esprimevo ad alta voce un pensiero privato segnalandomi di aver capito esattamente che cosa intendevo. Anche lui aveva visto il film, letto il libro o percepito proprio come me il ridicolo in una situazione che tutti gli altri, a torto, consideravano seria. A month ago, Haaretz, uh, which is the Israeli La Corriera della Sera, Ask thinkers and writers from all around the country to suggest an innovative idea that will solve a modern life problem. The problem I was aiming to solve was that as you grow up, it becomes harder to make new friends. And my idea was to create a Tinder app for friends <laughs> in which the match will not be done by looks, but rather by a common sense of humor. Since I, I am part of the startup nation, let's wait and see. Maybe some high-tech baron will read my suggestion, and next time we meet here in Bologna, we will be all using Tinder friends, uh, and it will be active. So this is about the beginning of friendship, but what about the end of friendship? What about losing a friend or losing a lover? This is another question I want to, to touch today. A lot was written about loss. Elizabeth Kobler-Ross even offered the famous five stages of loss. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But what about pre-loss? The weeks month or years in which the goodbye is already in the air. The protagonist in the last interview is about to lose his best friend Ari, who is ill with cancer. His wife does not love him anymore, and she's about to leave him, and his daughter leaves home for a dormitory school. He is suffering from dysthymia, which is a lighter version of depression, and surprisingly, towards the end of the book, He feels relieved immediately after he loses his wife and his friend. How come? How can that be possible? I recalled, he says, how every time we would move to another city when I was a child, I was sad month before the transfer. But when it finally happened, I was relieved. I believe that inside of me I was griefing the inevitable breakups from Ari and Dikla way before they actually occurred, going through all the five stages of Kobler Ross. And now an energy that was blocked inside of me is set free and I can start a new chapter in my life. Another question I want to touch today is the question of the road not taken. I don't know how it goes in Italy, but when I was in high school, we were told, were told to learn by heart a poem by the famous American poet, Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. You are nodding, so maybe you know the poem. For those of you who are not familiar with this beautiful poem, I will tell you, in a nutshell, that the protagonist in the poem has to choose between two similar roads that diverge in a yellow wood. He ends up choosing the road less traveled by. 
but all his life he keeps on thinking about the road not taken, the road he has not chosen. I recall this poem when I was starting in the, the process, the writing process of my novel Neuland. While developing the plot, I realized that Dori and Inbar, the main characters in the book, are actually getting a rare opportunity to walk in their own road not taken. While looking for his father, his lost father, who disappeared in South America, Dori and an unhappily married man meets in bar who is traveling to South America in order to decide whether to quit her job and leave her boyfriend. Dori and Inbar hook up. Inbar joins Dori's search. The chemistry between them is evident, but nothing, nothing really happens. Besides one kiss on the Ben Gurion airport in Israel on their way back when it's almost too late. But is it really too late? It seems that they cannot forget each other. They start emailing, and Inbar does not know what to do. Is there any chance for an honest love story between her and this married man? She consults her grandmother, grandmother Lily, who had her own road not taken in love, and therefore has her own ideas about this issue. So let's hear what Grandma Lily has to say. Sei stanca, nonna? Chiede. Vuoi che andiamo? A un figlio, hai detto, questo tuo innamorato? Apre gli occhi all'improvviso. Come se tutto d'un colpo fosse tornata la corrente. Sì, risponde in bar. Sì, ha un figlio di quattro anni. Ed è legato a suo figlio? Perché ci sono uomini che... È molto legato a lui. Allora puoi rispiarmiarti il cuore. Quest'uomo può essere solo un primus in Bari. Un primus? Così si chiamava il terzo incomodo che appioppavano alle coppie in kibbutz. E allora non capisco. Continua a stare con lui in Bari, nei pensieri nelle fantasie nei sogni anche questa è vita non solo quello che succede nella realtà ma anche quello che sarebbe potuto succedere ma cosa pensi Zipke Feuer di essere tanto speciale guardate intorno chiunque sia seduto in questo caffè in questo momento è seduto anche in un altro posto nella sua mente con qualcun altro accanto a ogni coppia che vedi qui di fronte alle candele c'è seduta una terza persona che uno dei due immagina che uno dei due è costretto a immaginare per poter rimanere seduto questa vostra Tel Aviv nu come potreste supportarla se non immaginaste un'altra città più bella di continuo eh? e il nostro paese? ebrei su ebrei che vivono nello stesso posto ma in testa hanno l'altro posto dal quale sono arrivati e l'altro posto in cui vorrebbero scappare domani e per fortuna che hanno questo in testa zip che foie, perché solo così grazie ai pensieri e alle fantasie di andare errando si può rinunciare a errare davvero e restare Oh, you are really good. Man. Say, so, like, you're reading from my inner music. It's, it's amazing. Maybe we were meeting in, a, in the past or something. I don't know. Oh, Some... the translation is really good. Oh, oh, yes. Actually, you, you did exactly what I wanted to say. Uh, my translator is Raffaella Scardi, and now I, I have the opportunity to, to hear the music of her translation. She's a I'm, I'm a very lucky guy. She's a, an amazing translator of Alice Gaudi. Okay, let's continue. Uh, use your imagination. Grandma Lily tells in bar, as you heard. As a fiction writer, 
I can, of course, relate to that. Imagining has been part of my life since I was a child, and then somehow it became my line of work. But is imagining a kiss exactly satisfying, like really kissing? I'm not sure. Maybe there is a limit to the ability of imagination to replace real acts, real changes, real roads you have to be brave enough to take. Khani, from the second floor of Trepiani, decides to use her imagination with the fugitive who finds refuge in her house. This fugitive, Eviatar, is the brother of her husband. Her husband is always away for work. She is alone with her two children, feeling so lonely that sometimes she thinks she's almost like a widow. Into this loneliness comes Eviatar. He asks her permission to stay in her house for 24 hours. He is a criminal. Her husband hates him. She has every reason to say no. But she is so lonely, she says yes. They start talking, he's interested in her, he listens, he charms her, and they end up imagining what they would have done to each other, with each other, if it was possible. Now, we will hear the reading, and afterwards I would talk about the very interesting difference I saw between Trepiani, the book, and Trepiani, the film. Sì, ha detto Eviatar, hai ragione, film è una parola problematica, forse è meglio usare storie. Immaginavo storie che mi portavano a te, in cui ci incontravamo per caso e finiva con... Uh, beh, lo sai, a volte persino mentre ero a letto con un'altra donna... Mm. So che stai mentendo, ma è molto piacevole, ho detto. O forse ho detto, perché me lo racconti? A che pro? O forse ho detto, fammi un esempio. Che cosa significa un esempio? Raccontami una di quelle storie che ti inventavi. È troppo imbarazzante, ha detto. Allora non ti credo, ho detto. Mi dai una sigaretta? ha chiesto. Pensavo trasmettesse qualcosa di negativo ai clienti. L'ho provocato. Ha allungato la mano per prendere una sigaretta alla faccia del sentirsi provocato. Se l'è accesa, poteva chinarsi verso di me e accendere la mia, ma ha preferito usare l'accendino. Sul dorso della mano aveva delle brutte chiazze. Ha aspirato a lungo, poi ha buttato fuori il fumo. Il mio fumo e il suo si sono mescolati nello spazio fra di noi. Ha detto, bisogna chiudere gli occhi, funziona solo a occhi chiusi. So, uh, for those of you who haven't read the book, they keep on imagining, telling this story together until they are both Relieved. Is imagining a love affair the same like having a love affair? And let's, let's ask an even more daring question. Is an extra marital love affair always a bad thing? Or can it, in some circumstances, be a surprising salvation? By the way, it was interesting for me to see the Nani Moeti interpretation to this story. In the movie Trepiani, Alba Rovachel, playing Hani, is becoming crazy. She's not imagining with the man, with the fugitive. She is imagining the fugitive. She's imagining him. He is not for real. And therefore, there is no love affair. Just her mental issues. While watching the movie, I, I wonder, is that a reflection of the cultural differences between Israel and Italy regarding marriage life. Anyway, I must say, and I, I've been waiting quite a long 
quite long to say that, that for me, Khani is a strong woman, completely sane, not a lunatic, not, not with a mental problem. She's seeking for support, empathy, and libido. She finds a very adaptive way to get exactly what she needs in order to survive. Let's stay with Trepiani and talk about another conflict of intimacy, the one between parenthood and couplehood. Devora, or Dora, as she was called in the Moretti adaptation, is a judge married to a judge. Their son, Adar, or Andrea, in the Italian version, was always a troublemaker. But one night, while drunk, he hits a pregnant woman with his car and kills her. Afterwards, he expects his parents to pull some strings and get him out of this. When they refuse, he hits the father, who is played by Nani Moetti in the movie, violently. This is the breaking point for the father, the point of no return. And he forces Dora to an impossible choice. It's either him or me, he tells her. If you want to be my wife, you can't see our child. The majority of the Jewish Israeli mothers who read the book told me, sometimes they told it to me angrily, <laughs> that they would have preferred the child on the husband. I can guess that it would be the same case with the Italian mama. <laughs> but Devora chooses to go with the husband because she tells him, I can't imagine my life without you, and awful as it may sound, I can't imagine my life without our son. Is that understandable? Can we forgive Margarita Bui when she does it in the film? Is it possible that in some cases, certain parents and certain children are better off not being in touch with each other, at least for a while? As I warned you today, we are only asking questions. The answers will echo in your thoughts, I hope. Another question, maybe one of the most loaded questions of our time when it comes to intimacy, is the question of consent. Me Too is one of the most important revolution of this century. I'm a father of three filia, three daughters, and I'm happy to see they are already influenced and empowered by Me Too. Or as my oldest daughter, she's 18 years old, she told me a week ago, nobody would dare touch me or my girlfriends without our permission. And if somebody does that mistake, he's in deep trouble. Just see how, it, how this revolution has changed. I, it wasn't like that in my generation. And, and that is, that is uh, uh, for me as a father, it's, it's, it's very important. But as a storyteller, I'm more interested in the gray, the gray areas between men and women. And in, even after Me Too, and maybe because of Me Too, there are still so many gray areas, so many unclear moments. For instance, Arnon from the first floor in Trepiani is seduced by the neighbor's granddaughter, Karin. She promises him information about what happened to his daughter during a babysitting session. She leads him to her house, and then she undresses. But she's also underaged, actually a virgin. Can you call the sex between Arnon and Karin consensual? In the Moretti adaptation, the judges decide it is consensual. I was much, much more, while writing this story, I was much more ambiguous about this issue. So, so I left it open to the decision of my readers. And what about Dr. Kao from Le Vie de Reden? He touches, for those of you who haven't read the book, Dr. Kao is, is a, a senior doctor in a hospital, and he touches by accident the edge of the breast of his young intern, Liat Ben Abo. Would we consider that harassment? 
And would Liat still consider it harassment if she would have known the real reason that Dr. Caro feels this very strong urge to be near her and protect her? Ambivalent, ambivalent situation, as my great teacher Amos Oz taught me, ambivalent situation are the best soil to grow stories on. Let's stay with Levia de Leden and ask another fascinating question. Do we really know the people who we consider close to us? Kheli, from uh, Levia de Leden, goes for a walk with her husband, Ofer, in an orchard, the Fruteto, near their house. When he enters the Fruteto, she's sure that he would return quickly. He leaves his, his cell phone with her, car keys. She's waiting for him, but he does not return. He disappears. Nobody knows what happened to him, and the police even considers her as a suspect. Why would a man around my age vanish from his own life? What kind of secret is he hiding? After Ofer disappears, she discovers he was writing a secret blog of short stories under a nickname. She reads the stories, hoping to find clues that will lead her to him. Let's hear one of the stories. Uh, a dream he had about his ex-girlfriend, his army sweetheart. Il sogno ricorrente. Ti ho sognato di nuovo. Viaggiavamo insieme in taxi ad Haifa. Avevamo vent'anni e allo stesso tempo ne avevamo 48. Indossavamo la divisa bianca della marina, ma tu avevi con le rughe agli angoli degli occhi e io i capelli bianchi. Il taxi si è fermato e un attimo prima che le nostre strade si dividessero mi hai chiesto come stai? Ho avuto l'impressione che lo volessi sapere davvero, allora ho risposto solo. E ho allungato il braccio per afferrarti la vita, stringerti a me, mi hai respinto. Naturale che mi hai respinto. Avrei dovuto saperlo che mi avresti respinto. Anche in sogno. Nonostante tutto, adesso che mi sono svegliato, vorrei chiederti, tu, come stai? So, uh, thank you, thank you. I, I'm looking at the audience. We have a majority of women today. So, so I will talk in a feminine uh, in, 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 uh, language. So how would you feel if you found out that your husband or your boyfriend has written a story like this? The same husband or boyfriend that recently seemed to you so happy, so satisfied? The last question I wanted to raise today is about the tricky connection between technology and intimacy. Think about Zoom, for instance. During the pandemic, Zoom enabled us to be in touch with each other. But now, in many fields, people are still using Zoom. Is it like this in Italy also for, yeah. Yeah, for work? They're having their meetings online instead of face-to-face. -face. It's more efficient, they say, but they spend, or we spend, days without actually being in the presence of another human being. Aren't we paying a price which is too high? The man and woman I wrote about in the short story published in Vanity Fair under the title Web are getting intimate via emails, sending each other links. But their communication, I think most, most of our communication today, or at least a big part of it is non-synchronic or asynchronic, which means we're not doing it at the same time. It's not a real dialogue, it's not a conversation. Will this be enough, these e email correspondence, is it enough to bring them to each other's non-virtual arms eventually? 
Poche ore dopo la riunione in cui i loro sguardi si erano incrociati, gli manda via mail il link a una canzone di Kate Bush. In risposta lui le manda il link a una canzone di Bruce Priesting. Allora lei gli manda il link a una scena del film prima dell'alba. Lui le manda il link a una scena del film prima del tramonto. Lei riesce a trattenersi per 24 ore, poi gli manda il link a una canzone di Loren Hill. Due minuti dopo lui le manda il link all'indicazione per una escursione. Lei pensa, e adesso? Lui pensa, e adesso? Lei non gli manda un link, gli manda parole. Scrive magari, ma non possiamo. Lui le manda il link a un vecchio clip. Sting, vestito di bianco, balla fra le candele, confessa di essere avvolto intorno al suo dito e spera che lei sarà avvolta intorno al dito di lui. Lei non ha intenzione di rispondere. Che senso avrebbe? Ma dopo qualche giorno cede e gli manda il link a una poesia che ha pubblicato in rete, sul web, diversi anni prima, con uno pseudonimo. Lui, attraverso la canzone, vede che anima bella è lei e glielo scrive lei trema dentro e risponde grazie <ride> poi chiede che sia lui a mandarle qualcosa di suo se c'è lui manda in link a un racconto che ha pubblicato in rete di recente con uno pseudonimo lei attraverso il racconto vede quanto è solo e glielo scrive lui trema dentro e manda di nuovo il link all'indicazione per la stessa escursione. Lui pensa, e adesso? Lei pensa, e adesso? So many, so many unclear moments in this uh, asynchronic communication while you were reading I had this memory it was about I think six or seven years ago emojis started to appear in our life and I was working with a, a it was a company of lectures and readings in, in pubs they were promoting lectures and reading in pubs having a, a, a completely professional correspondence with one of the girls in this company around 25 years old and suddenly she sends me a beating heart. No? I come from a generation <laughs> that when you send a beating heart to someone, this is, uh, you, you have thought about it for weeks, months, it, it has a, it, it's an invitation. So I was, I was really confused that there was no vibe between us. There was nothing, just... So it, it took a while until I understood that a beating heart is actually Just a nice way of saying, hello, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> and it's getting worse. We have reached the end of our quest, but not really. While preparing this lecture, I realized how much has changed since I started writing about intimacy 20 years ago. Changes have occurred in the world and changes have occurred in my private life. Questions that tortured me in the past were replaced by new ones, not less passionate. But one thing remained solid, the craving. The craving to understand, the craving to be understood, and of course the craving to make a story out of it. I hope my words found a place in your heart today. If only one of my questions resonated with your life, I am happy, and I will be more happy if all this talking about intimacy will make you want to be more intimate and honest with your close lovers, friends, and family members. We will finish with lines from uh, Trepiani. It's the third floor. It's almost the finishing lines of the book. Capisci, Sigmund Freud era un uomo molto intelligente, ma ieri sera 
dopo aver terminato l'ultimo volume dell'opera Omnia e averlo posato sul comodino, e ho pensato che un errore l'ha fatto. I tre piani dell'anima non esistono dentro di noi, ma niente affatto, esistono nello spazio tra noi e l'altro, nella distanza tra la nostra bocca e l'orecchio di chi ascolta la nostra storia. E se non c'è nessuno ad ascoltare, eh, allora non c'è nemmeno la storia. Se non c'è uno così a cui svelare segreti, con cui sciorinare ricordi e consolarsi, allora... e allora si parla con la segreteria telefonica, Michael. L'importante è parlare con qualcuno, altrimenti tutti soli non sappiamo nemmeno a che piano ci troviamo. Siamo condannati a brancolare disperatamente nel buio, nell'atrio, in cerca del pulsante della luce. Thank you very much, both of you, <laughs> because it was wonderful to listen to your questions and to your readings. Uh, if you have any questions or answers, because we, <laughs> we, we might want answers, answers too, uh, please, uh, there's a... Oh, you can use this one, too, maybe. Okay. okay. You can pose questions both in English and Italian because he, he has the headphones with translation. So. Does it work? No. No. <laughs> okay, now it works. Okay. Okay, this is a question. Thank you. I, I say it in English and then in Italian. Uh, I was wondering uh, about the, your book, it's The Last in Interview. It's in Italian. In Italian, sorry. Um, il libro, il romanzo, l'ultima intervista, eh, lei utilizza questa forma a mio parere come una sorta di mediazione tra il pubblico e il privato quindi una forma forse che serve per porre un freno all'intimità all'eccesso di intimità oppure è un mezzo secondo lei per esprimerlo come ha pensato questa forma narrativa rispetto al concetto di intimità grazie uh, you're talking about uh, the last interview The last interview actually started with a writer's block. I, I tried to write another book, and I was stuck. I hit the wall. It was a very high wall, and I couldn't climb. So I put the book I was working on aside, and I started playing this game. And the game was, I will take all the questions I am asked during readings or interviews, And I will answer by, or with, the most brutal, honest, non-politically correct answer I never had the courage to answer. The secret, authentic answer I'm keeping to myself. Now, this was a game, and the, and the other rule of this game was I would never publish it. <laughs> It's only for self-usage. So I was writing uh, uh, the last interview for the, all these questions and answers for three months, and then there were already 60 pages of questions and answers, and then I kind of, I read it from scratch, and I, I realized that there's, uh, it's a novel, like there's a plot, there are characters, there are plot lines, there are, 
motives that are reoccurring. I, without, not deliberately, I have, I've, I've, I'm writing a novel. Now, of course, this got me into trouble <laughs> because these answers were not supposed to be published. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm joking about this now, but uh, I made the adjustment. There's a lot of fiction in this book. There's, it's not biography. It's a mix of biography and fiction. But when the book was published in Israel, it was a very challenging time in my life because I was the closest, the most intimate, if we're talking about intimacy today, I was creating this very intimate bond with my readers, enough with, the, enough with pretending, enough with answers that are supposed to be smart. But let's, let's, let's be honest with each other. And it was, it was uh, almost impossible to publish the book uh, in Israel. I felt uh, that it's maybe too much for me, for my family, uh, but eventually, it's, it, uh, the, this storm passed in our life and it was okay. And then afterwards, there's always the joy of publishing the same book in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> because here already, when I come for, to, to, uh, to talk about a book, it's already not my biography, it's, it's art, it's fiction. When I talk to, about L'Ultima Eta Vista, here and, and then afterwards in other countries, it's, 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 a fiction, it's a fiction book already. It's very intimate, but it's already a work of art. So thank God I have the opportunity to publish a book in Italy and actually enjoy that. Because in Israel, it's much more complicated. It's, I think it's always the, the most complicated to publish work in your own country, where your family lives, your relatives, your friends, your mother. My mother read... My, my, my mother reads all my books <laughs> before they are, pub, they are published. And she always has the same response. Always the same response. She says, she calls me on the phone and she said, Oh, my dear son, I didn't know that you feel that way. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? She's a psychologist. <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? I said, Mother, this is fiction. Fiction. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, so, yeah, so, so, thank God for Italian versions. <laughs> I don't have an uh, Italian mama here to, to call me. We can provide one. <laughs> Gianluca. Grazie per eh, l'incontro. Eh, mi manca l'ultimo libro, ma negli altri, eh, come credo molti dei presenti, sono stato colpito da un fatto. Eh, molti uomini sono, emergono dalla lettura, sofferti, dubbiosi. Io ho percepito, forse una mia proiezione, forse no, infatti le chiedevo questo, Vedo donne forti, risolute, decise, capaci di governare la propria vita e in qualche misura anche quella delle persone che le circondano. Molte separazioni sono guidate, lo dicevi prima, dalle donne. Ecco, questo riflette una tua, uso il tu per semplicità traduttiva, il, una tua visione della società israeliana, del mondo, di te delle relazioni fra uomo e donna, è un universale, è una curiosità che però mi ha colpito. Grazie. It's a beautiful question. <laughs> uh, I think it reflects the fact that I, I grew up with a very strong mother and I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about um, uh, the kind of uh, um, tyrant or dictator mother. It's very strong in the sense of realizing her dreams, of going after her passions, of uh, saying what, what she thinks uh, and, and being sensitive enough to know how to say it. And being also, my mother taught me how to say sorry. She was always strong enough to say sorry if she, she did wrong. So I, I grew up with a, with a strong mother and, and maybe not by chance I married a very strong and impressive wife. 
And I, you know, take into consideration that I am now living in a house of women, okay? I have three daughters, <laughs> so I am surrounded. Sometimes I feel that there are conversations in our house that I, I cannot even understand <laughs> what they are talking about. <laughs> So, so, yeah, it, 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 it is uh, maybe reflected in my, in my work, in my uh, books. And also, you know, I think about, I, as I told you, I have two of my closest friends are divorcing now. And it's quite amazing to see that how men are collapsing after divorce while the women are actually functioning. <laughs> and, and because they're caring about the children, they are, they are, they are working, and, and while my friends are in pieces. So, you know, uh, maybe, maybe it tells us something about who, who is really the strong gender. Okay. Any other question? Uh, I just uh, <clears throat> have a, a comment. But uh, I was surprised that, uh, by the fact that uh, uh, you were compelled to think about what you wrote and what, you, what your characters are, <clears throat> and to know them better than uh, when you wrote about them. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's that uh, uh, a normal feeling for a writer, because I am not a fiction writer, <laughs> I write... Uh, essays and things like that, that they are not uh, supposed to be fictional at all. <laughs> so, um, and so I, I wonder whether uh, for you it's a kind of discover uh, about your own uh, creations uh, sometimes. I think what happened with this uh, lecture specifically, this, this lecture, like the lecture on hope, was written especially for, for the Bologna uh, uh, Umberto Eco series. So, so I, I had to reflect, in a way, on my work. And, I, and it's, we're talking about 20 years, so I came back to stories and characters I haven't been thinking about for a while. And I'm not the same person uh, who wrote Nostalgia. I wrote Nostalgia when I was 31. I'm now 51. So I asked myself, can I, stick, can I still connect to this? And, and sometimes, yes. Sometimes, for instance, the law of preservation of sadness that you were reading, I still feel it. I still feel it. I feel it in, my, in the relationship with my wife. I feel it with friends. I, I feel this osmosis. It's still relevant. While other questions are, are less dramatic now in my life. So I think what we should do is that we should set a lecture 20 years from now, about intimacy. It's the same title. And I, I have the feeling that the questions will not be the same questions because, yeah, it, life changes you. Well, in 20 years. Okay, with the date. Uh, yeah, it's a date. It's a day. In the spring, not hot, not cold. I'm free too. <laughs> We hope to be there. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. no. Okay. If there are no further questions, uh, I would like to say something. I wrote down things, but because because uh, thanking people is the most difficult thing. So <laughs> before leaving. <clears throat> I would like to thank several people who made this evening possible. First of all, the staff of the University Library uh, who supported me uh, in the realization of this conference, the Pact for the Reading, Patto per la Lettura, uh, of the Municipality of Bologna, which involved its network of readers for this occasion, to my friend and colleague Riccardo Fedriga, uh, who helped me to get in touch with Nevo, <coughs> the Italian publisher, the communication office of Neri Pozzi, in particular Daniela Pagani, 
the staff of the communication office and press office of the University of Bologna. It is always a pleasure to work with them. And above all, I would like to thank uh, Articulture, <clears throat> the agency that took care of the practical organization, the simultaneous translations, uh, and, and uh, I would like to thank in particular the translators, uh, and the online streaming service, in particular Valentina Ferretti and Fabrizio Cabizza, Simone Francia for his wonderful reading. <clears throat> And uh, you, you understand why I, I proposed him uh, to... <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Okay, um, for the reading of selected passages from Nevo's books. And finally, I would like to thank Eskol Nevo again for his kindness. And thank you all, and see you. <clears throat>